Hey, Rob, how are you? Good to see you again. Yeah. The just problem talking about with having a really large monitor is I look like I'm looking all over the guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I have to tame myself down here. So you guys have, uh, have launched some really exciting software, hardware, mostly software? It's both. Well, it's yeah, it's both. It's, it's part of the 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 Atlas II, which has you know been out for for a little bit. But you know, we we built the Atlas II knowing we were going to do this, and so a right. lot of its hardware design included the, the intention of doing race sense. Yeah, well, it's exciting. Why don't we go ahead and and first off, let's introduce who you two guys are, and uh, and then tell us about this beast race sense and what it's all about. Jake, I'll, I'll, well, I'll go first. My name is Todd Wilson. I'm one of the founders of uh, Vicaros, and I lead most of the software efforts here. Okay. And my name is Jake Carlin. I'm a hardware engineer and co-founder of Vicaros, and uh, just super excited to see the Atlas IIs out there doing race tents. It's, it's been pretty awesome to see how well it's working. I bet. I love the Atlas II. I'm an owner on my Melgus 15, and uh, I'm loving it. I'm still trying to learn all the features um but it's a great product and so that's why i'm really excited to hear about race sense and introduce it to our people um what is it what's race sense so race sense takes the hardware in the atlas 2 and we're using it to actually run races so everything from synchronizing your start timers sharing the position of the line live during the sequence um, and then making ocs calls uh, when the timer hits zero to help take some of the burden off a race committee and make it easier to run really high quality racing, even at the club level, uh, but also to improve the experience for the sailors and give you some of that Grand Prix experience on an LGS 15 or any other boat that you might be sailing. Uh, and we are so excited with how well it's working and, and what it can do ultimately for the sport. Um, and some of the big problems we're trying to address are things like you know, multiple general recalls that we've all experienced at regattas. And it's not just the headache and the, and the loss of time racing that you get from that. Sometimes that means you don't get in that last race of the day or the wind shuts off and you miss an opportunity to go racing when you could have. Uh, black flag starts that can you know, ruin an event if you happen to be over on the wrong start. Um, and just you know, the headache of trying to keep everybody on the same page with race committee, waiting for boats to reping in classes that allow uh, distance to line. So there's a lot of you know, really great stuff that race sense brings onto the water. And how does race sense do that? Each end of the line, which with an Atlas II, and that could be on the committee boat, it could be on a mark set bot, it could be on an anchored mark. We don't really care. We just need the Atlas II positioned at each end of the line. They're sharing their positions live. So now, instead of going up and pinging the line, all the boats know where the line is. And since they know where they are and they know where the line is, now they're able to make that start line call. When race committee starts a timer, everybody else's timer in the fleet gets started at the same moment and they're all synced down to the microsecond. So we all know exactly when the race start is going to happen. There's no more watching for flags, waiting for you know, a, a call that you may or may not hear over the VHF radio. You just see your Atlas II light up and you know the race is going to start. And then when the timer hits zero, the Atlas II is going to determine if you were over the line or not. If you're over, you're going to get red lights and OCS and that's going to get reported back to race committee. Sounds like a really real advantage. Uh, I've been over the line occasionally where it's a individual recall and you're sitting there wondering, was it me or was that other guy was on yeah, the hip? Yeah. I think he was a little oh, yeah. me. It, it's up. a better experience for the competitor and it's more fair. So if you've ever been in a fleet where you know they'll do the courtesy of calling you on the radio, you know, sometimes that call may come a, a while later. And that's a very frustrating experience, right? When you realize you've been sailing for a minute. And, and they finally call you or they reviewed their information and they've realized that you were over. And of course, you know, the rule is the, you know, the onus is on the competitor to figure that out. But at the same time, it's just, it's not particularly a great experience. Um, so this instantaneous feedback they are over is universal across the fleet, right? Everyone gets the same amount of notification time that they were over. And so we think that's, you know, going to be a better experience for the competitor in terms of just their sailing it's a better experience for the race committee and that they're providing that more fair experience and it's more consistent that's a great point the other the other thing as a race committee person is you don't always see that other boat right so that's right you catch yeah. the numbers you can catch and then maybe there are four more boats that really were over yeah um so i'm the guy you saw i have to go back but the other four don't yeah it, it evens the playing field Calling the start line is such a hard problem, you know, for even a really well-trained 
person to do and getting to work with some of these great PROs who've been helping us develop race since I have got gained a real appreciation for how skilled they are and how good at that job they are and how much training and practice goes into that. But we've also seen situations where there's just even as good as they are, if you can't see the boat, you don't know that they're over. Or in other fleets, you maybe you can see that someone is over, but you can't identify who they are because you know you can't see the bow number or you know, the e-scout fleet is a great example of this. You know, the sail numbers are on the back of the sail, the boats, right. there's no bow numbers, they all look the same on the front. Right. So, you know, rates PROs are left with the choice between doing a general recall or perhaps allowing in some cases some boats to go, even if they think they were over, but it was, you know, generally speaking, a, a more or less fair start. The great thing with race tents is we can call half the fleet over, three quarters of the fleet over. Whoever's over is going to get notified. Uh, yeah. There's no there's no issue with identification, mm -hmm. and you know it's it's accurate enough that we think in in almost every situation it's going to be able to be as accurate or more accurate than a person trying to make that same call. And Again, what is the race going to have? So we have an atlas on each end of the line. We uh, we may have an atlas up on the windward mark too for for rounding counting. Mm -hmm. um, but what is the race committee looking at? So race committee, you know, you said each ended line is represented by an atlas, um, and then you can additionally use other atlases either in like a repeating role for the mesh network or in a coordinator role or, at, like you said, at other marks. Um, but race committee's interface to all this is using uh, a tablet on a mobile application that we've built. And it can be an Android tablet or an iOS tablet. It'll, it'll be a list of tablets that we will approve because we want to do some very thorough testing to make sure that we are happy with it. So. Um, you can't bring some strange, obscure tablet we've never heard of before, but we'll we'll, we'll get a, a a nice long list of very common tablets. Well, and I'm then you said that because I thought maybe you were building your own, you know, tablet. <laughs> no, and, no, uh, no, 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 it's, no. It's, it's, it's not an Android tablet in that photo. Yeah. But, I mean, there are plenty uh, to OEM, but nonetheless, no, yeah. <laughs> that, that that one is 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 one we like. It's it's quite tough. It's a very bright, it's kind of like a, like a tough book kind of equivalent for an Android tablet. Um, but we're, we'll support a, a, a number of devices. Um, and it's kind of uh, fun. You uh, get this. Let me, uh, let me interrupt you just because you brought something up. That's an excellent point. Um, brightness of some of these tablets on the water could be a real problem. So oh, yeah. you having a set that you know tend to work really well to recommend to people, because not every race committee member is technically savvy. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. And so, yeah, obviously, we, we wish we could use you know, the display technology on something like the Atlas, um, because, you know, we're, we're very familiar with this problem and the, the Atlas works much uh, great in the sun. Um, but we needed more screen real estate, you know, arguably for, for this. So, yeah, we, we chose, uh, you know, tablets that were, were built more for, for outdoor work um, and, and they'll get better. It, it's still, you know, tough. You, you probably would want, you know, some kind of cover if you can get it right. if it's a very bright day. Um, but the tablet gives us enough screen real estate where you can really see, you know, the the map and the list of competitors and all the the, the timer functionality. And it's it's quite fun using it actually. It's um, it it, it kind of turns uh, race committee into almost like a video game um, where you just you just you know have this wonderful view of everybody and their status. And you just when you're ready to go, you just push go. You type in what time in uh, GPS UTC you want the race to start, and you just hit it, and then all the timers start all the stats and you can just watch and, and see everything and um it's great because you know you're not it, obviously it'll, it'll help you with you know operating the flags but we're finding in a lot of our test events that the the race officers are actually quite happy to not deal with all of that and and just focus really on the racing which wasn't really our goal we're not we're not trying to change how how racing is performed um but it's it's been fun to to watch the the PROs use it and, and really enjoy the experience. So um, the so the the race committee when they when they say to start the race, it actually sends a message to all the Atlas twos on the competitor mm -hmm. boats to start the yes. countdown. Yeah. Oh. So yep. the, the, the mesh network just distributes the this is the when the race the next race starts, um, and so it's and it's all synchronized down again all the the atlases because they they use GPS time as their source of time. We are nanosecond precise right. uh, on this, so we just agree that this is the the time of of zero, as we call it, um, for the race, and then they all start counting down. And this this is really a nice quality of life improvement because, so say you're a, a race officer and you just finished a race, and you know you're going to do the next race in about 15 minutes, right? And so you can go ahead and start the timer for for the race, and then go in the sequence at five like normal. 
but the competitors know your intentions, right? Their, 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 their timers already started. They know like, oh, we have time for a sandwich or the talk bit, you get some water. Right. And, you know, they're not sitting there waiting, you know, to hear you on the radio, which you may or may not have. Um, so it, it, it really allows the, the race officers to, to really be on schedule, you know, and, and, and really, you know, in execute the, the races as they intend. Um, and, and make sure that all competitors are, are aware, are equally right? Yeah. Eligible. Yep. Right. Yep. And it's great. Uh, um, any rough idea of cost? Is this all license cost, like a subscription thing? We are still figuring this out. So, you okay, know, obviously there, there, there's the, the cost of, uh, of the Atlas. We're also going to have a rental model because we understand that's going to be necessary for helping events to try this out and making it practical because, you know, not everyone owns our, our instrument. And then th there will be some sort of, you know, in the future licensing costs, but our goal is to make this really affordable. Like we, we want this to be not really, we don't want the cost to really be a part of the, 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 the strong consideration of do you use this or not? We want to be, well, you know, do we want to, you know, improve the experience, have the, the quality of racing that, you know, we think we can achieve. And, and we think the cost of our system is, is really going to not be a factor in, you know, the, the determination of whether you use it or not. In fact, we, we believe that we actually are going to save events money because we're going to decrease your, your volunteer load and the amount of resources you're going to need on the water, not to mention time. Um, and of course, there's the intangible values, right? Like how much is it worth to not sit in a room arguing for redress on a start, right? Yeah. Or to get that extra race in, you know, because yeah. it was, you know, 15 minutes before the last race could be scheduled and you were able to do it because you had race yeah, sense. Right. Uh, I think and your, and your biggest offenders get, you know. Yeah, right. They get so, their penalty so, and that causes them do. to stop doing it because yeah. they know they're not going to yeah. be able to get away with it. Yeah. We uh, were actually a certain regatta in Sardinia, right? And you, <laughs> you, you, you traveled to this island and you moved your boat and you flew in your crew and you got housing and food and everything and on day one you get double black flagged right, <laughs> like, right. yeah that shouldn't yeah. be necessary yeah. um you know you might not show up to the next event if that was your experience and and that's what we want we want people to show up we want them to have fun and we think this makes it easier to do that this is you you, can, you provide a better quality experience you yeah. mentioned um uh training and maybe less personnel the other thing that strikes me is that uh, because you're taking a lot of the complexity, you know, I know a lot of race committee teams, they're all tied up around flag lifting and how the timer's going and all this stuff. If you take a lot of that complexity out, now you can put a relatively inexperienced person yep. on race committee and still get a, get a good team together. That's right. We haven't really talked about it, but one of the things uh, on the tablet that, I personally quite like is it's got this great display that will, when you tell it what time the race to start, it will, it has this sort of tile view of like, here's all the actions of the race you're going to do. So it tells you, it counts you into the P flag up, it counts you into down and class flag up. It, it gives you just basically the instructions of like, here's how you run the race committee. We've, we've right. had a lot of uh, input from PROs to help do that. But, you know, I, and we get to, we're spoiled. We get to work with a lot of high end PROs on testing of this app, but it's, our goal was that this is for club level racers. This is for people who don't do race committee every weekend as, you know, their job or, or, you know, their passion. Um, this is for people like me who have to show up, you know, a couple <laughs> times a year and be like, Oh yeah, how do I do this again? Yeah. Um, and it makes it much easier. Which is well, a, I think lot one of the, a lot of sailing yeah. is, is yeah. smaller, not yeah. the big Bahamas yeah. type thing. Miami, et cetera. Yeah, we're yeah. really excited about what this can do at the high end of the sport where, you know, making really accurate OCS calls is a really big deal, or you want to experiment with a, a new piece of technology like being able to do course boundaries, which Race Sense can support. But I think for us as sailors, we're even more excited about what it can do at the club level, at, you know, regional and local regattas where it can be really difficult to pull together a good race committee team. And by doing that, in many cases, that's people who are choosing to do race committee instead of go sailing. It's oftentimes people coming from the same fleet. Right. And so if we can reduce the burden on race committee to the point where it can be someone who doesn't necessarily have to have a ton of training and skill level to still run really good quality racing and just reduce the number of people who need to be out there, you know, as Todd said, that, that saves cost. It means more people can go sailing. It reduces the environmental footprint of an event. You don't necessarily need to have as many chase boats out there or the ones that are out there can just be focused on safety instead of you know, some of the race committee actions. There's a ton of benefit that comes there 
and you know, so you're getting sort of the best of both worlds. You're reducing the, the training and, and workload number of people, and you're getting an improved racing experience at the same time. So I, I think it's a huge, huge win-win, especially at the you know, club level. Yeah. By taking some of the, the, the challenging jobs that are really hard for a person to do. So, you know, calling the start, just staying in sync with the flags and the timer, you know, those aspects that, that consume a lot of your, your thought process when you're race committee, it frees the PRO up to focus on other things like making sure they set a great course, making sure they know what the wind is doing, you know, paying attention to feedback from competitors on how many more races they might want to have that day or when they want to go back to the dock. So the PRO still has an important job to do, but they can focus more on the things that they're really good at and that, you know, technology can't solve and let the technology take care of the things that are hard for a person to do really well. Do I enter, I'm flying a U flag or an I flag such that you know you automatically can feed the scoring system with what the penalty would be? Yep. So we we will support all of that. We will support um, flag U, I, and Z, um, you know, scoring penalties. And we will ultimately also be able to, to handle, you know, for uh, I and Z, the exoneration uh, structure for those, as well as other exoneration uh, strategies that, you know, fleets may want to try out. For example, someone want to try the VMG loss or um, you know, stay away from the ends or, or, or take or do attack or however you want to do it. There's lots of options. Um, but yes, our, our goal is to, to support all of those. Again, we, our hope is that um, using race sense, you will never need to fly a black or U flag again, or, or even the others possibly, but that that's up for race committees to decide. That's not our decision. Right. Um, so we will obviously support that. Um, but, you know, obviously we hope that the, the need for those we think is coming from um, trying to force the competitors to be more conservative to make it so that yeah. race committee doesn't get overwhelmed by boats coming at the line. But we remove that that burden, right? Again, the you know, whole fleet could be over for all we care. Uh, what about auto setting fleet compliance? Yep. That's a great question. Yeah. Go ahead, Jake. Yeah. So so one of the great things about race sense is it is fully compatible with our class compliance modes. Um, so what that means is let's let's take an example. Let's say you were going to run uh, race sense on a thistle where the what you're allowed to have is a compass and a timer, right? That's what the rules specify. The cool thing is you can actually do that and run race sense at the same time. Uh, and race sense in that situation would be running completely in the background. So it's invisible to the competitor. They're just mm -hmm. got a compass and a timer. Their timer will still start automatically. Mm -hmm. They're not going to get distance to line. And then it's up to race committee to decide if at the start you want to automatically notify the boats that they're OCS or that information can just be reported back to race committee and they can continue to fly the flag and notify them as they would have um, traditionally. Right. But that allows race sense to be compatible with any class out there. So it can be anywhere from just providing information back to race committee all the way through to the full, you know, Grand Prix experience with the, you know, penalty lights and, you know, distance line and everything else. And that's just a setting in software. So a, a fleet like the Thistle could say, we're going to experiment with the you know, the full system on the practice day just to see what it's like. And then we'll run our, our actual regatta, you know, within our class rules. So it, it opens the doors for fleets to try something, decide if it makes sense for them, and, and then just pick, you know, pick the setup that they want to run with. It strikes me that that capability also allows um, possibly the changing of some fleet regs. Mm -hmm. In the 15, we're not allowed to have time to line. If they had race sense where the, the argument historically that I've heard is we don't want each boat to have to go to each end of the line, ping it. Oh, yeah. And if yeah. I, I move an end, now everybody has to reping. Yeah. And so you solve all that, right? That's so right. maybe it yeah. becomes a vehicle for helping to enable um, time to line because the boats automatically are receiving the GPS coordinates. They're not having to ping the line themselves. Yeah, our, our philosophy is we want to make it easy. We, we want, we are not going to dictate the classes, right. you know, how they use that system. We are adaptable for what they want to do. We want to make it easy for them both to be compliant, but yes, also experiment and try things out. Let's do a, you know, the, the most 15, for example, yeah, they, they don't allow distance to line, but they could, you know, on a practice day, turn it on and let everybody try it. Um, or yeah, things like time to line and, and or, or even, you know, do a do a race with boundaries, which is mm -hmm. is actually really fun. Um, yeah. You know, have have sort of like that Grand Prix kind of experience, and just you know yeah, see what it's like. It, it, it forces a lot of fun boat on boat uh, scenarios. Yeah. Um, now you don't use this for mark placement. This isn't a way. No. Okay. So so yeah. we we partner with uh, with companies such as like Marks at Bot and and others, um, and, and we think that 
you know, our company and companies like that coming together is, is sort of the, the, the perfect of combination, right? So yeah. uh, for making the, the whole process easier. Yeah, it makes um, a lot of sense. And, you don't want to do and that for us, you know, we, it, 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 us supporting any of those other uh, marks is as simple as just put the Atlas on the mark. Right? Yeah. That's, it. Yes. That's all you have to do. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah pretty incredible. Oh, and then uh, mast mounting, or, or the, the idea was, okay, how do you know I'm over the line, depending on where I put the Atlas? So yeah, you would great. basically standardize where the Atlas is located and then set an offset? Great question. Correct. So the race sense actually uses a model of the shape of the boat so we can actually call you not only with your bow over the line but if your your transom is over the line or you know the beam of your boat is over the line because you're running down the line at the start we can call that over as well and you know on bigger boats that matters more on on small dinghies you know you're unlikely to be in that situation but if you're sailing a ic-37 and coming back to the start you could have the transom over the line um so we the intent here is that the for any given class, you would have a standardized mounting location that's accepted, and we know the position, you know, the bow offset, where it is uh, on the center line of the boat. Uh, in the future, we will have the ability to support different mounting locations on different boats, and that would be important for something like handicap racing, where there, there isn't possible to have a standardized location. Right, right. Oh, fascinating. There's enough accuracy in there that you actually, it matters. We can call the beam of the boat over the line. So right. be careful at the start. You guys have a lot of work going on. All right, so uh, from that. a sailor benefits, at first it looked like sailor benefits were kind of the, you know, backside of this thing, but it sounds like sailor benefits are actually pivotal. They're really right in there. It's not just a race uh, committee uh, benefit to race sense. Uh, the pinging the line we talked about, um, this idea of immediate notification if I'm I'm an individual recall boat. Um then scoring, it sounded like one of the things you show in your marketing literature is the idea that as I cross the line, I know what place I am. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right? which is great. You know, it's, uh, you're not sitting there trying to, to count. Um, or, you know, if you're in a close finish, um, you know, it's, it's nice yeah. to know immediately. You're not, you know, yelling at race committee, like, who was it? Of course, they never tell you. Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, we would know immediately. So uh, compared to those challenges of starting the, you know, scoring finish, this is actually uh, much easier. And uh, I certainly uh, can speak from experience that sometimes race committee just does it wrong. In fact, I, I recently got this wrong. We were in a fleet where the boats were sort of identified by color and there were two sort of bluish boats. Um, apparently mm -hmm. I got those backwards. Right. And I caused I cause a little bit of uh, some drama. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, people make mistakes. Um, and so, you know, we, we would avoid those kind of issues, right? Uh, the Blazer fleet's another great example, right? We're just the, you know, the numbers are just, you know, there's so many of them, right. um, you know, people get the order out and, you know, it's, it's, it's or difficult. You, just see, you see the first two numbers and you go, it must right. be this yeah. one, but it was actually. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So all that problem kind of goes away and then, yeah, you can, you can immediately know what your score was, which is, uh, yeah. which is great for the competitor. The cool thing about the, the race sense technology and the fact that this is just atlases, it's not some other piece of hardware that you have to rent for an event or, you know, licensing fees or something like that. It's just the core instrument you already own is it opens the door to all kinds of fun things that we can do on the water that go beyond, you know, what a traditional, you know, regatta or racing experience um, has. So we're starting there, but that's not where it ends. There's, there's a lot more to come uh, after that as well. Well, what, what's interesting is it brings so much more, um, you know, the, the sport of sailing is is difficult for some people to participate in and keeping people engaged is so important. And that's where what we try to do as salesing is help people who aren't champions with coaches and all that help help them sail better. Um, but when you have a really sophisticated device like this, then software is cheap. Yeah. Yep. Apparently the time to create it isn't cheap, but once you have it, it's cheap. So exactly. Uh, I think. For me, that's probably my favorite thing about the Atlas is every month it does something new and a year from now it's going to do something that we haven't even thought of yet. And oftentimes that actually starts with a customer saying, hey, could we do this or it would be cool if we could do that or how would I know if I'm doing this well? And then we'll go think about it and work on it and, and push it out. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that really makes it such a great instrument is it just gets better and better and better over time. And Race Sense is a great example of that. The hardware has been there the whole time and now the software is coming. Right. Yeah, really exciting. 
Uh, Todd said this actually in your M32 uh, video. Ultimately, we want race sense to not just be available for high performance classes like this. We want it to be across the sport so that any fleet can use this system to augment their experience. Bingo. Great. Yeah. I was just going to say, so that making that possible is everything from making the system really easy to use, easy to set up, both for the you know organizers, but also for the competitors. So one of the things we didn't talk about with Race Sense, when you come to an event, you're going to check in your atlas. So when you either go pick up your registration packet, or maybe if you're going through measurement, Race Committee is going to scan the QR code on your atlas with the tablet, and they're going to say, okay, this atlas goes with this boat. From that point forward, all you have to do as a competitor is remember to bring the device on the water and, and turn, turn it on. on. And yeah. as long as you can do those two things, that's it. There's yeah. no extra setup. You know, it's, it's, and there's no, the other thing that's great is because, you know, the battery life is phenomenal, super easy to recharge it. Yeah. So you don't have to bring it back at the end of the day and have somebody collect it and charge it and hand it back to you in the morning. Right. It's your, it's your instrument, whether you own it or you rent it, it's your instrument for the duration of the event. You just bring it on the water, you turn it on and race sense will take care of everything else. Yeah, that is very convenient. And I, I rarely have to charge it. Yeah. It, yeah. It lasts a long time. Yeah. yeah. It's about a hundred hours, which you know, you can do a whole week-long regatta without even having to charge it. Yeah, yeah. Very handy. I mean, I don't want to have to think about charging it in the evening, you know. No, no. I have other things to do after a day of racing. So um, yeah. that's really awesome. Uh, how soon might we see race sense at a regatta near me? Pretty soon, soon as possible. Uh, um, we are, our, our calendar is just getting more and more booked up with events right now. And um, if, if your fleet is, is interested, please get in touch with us and, and see if we can fit you in. We're, we're, we're continuing to, to test and, um, you know, introduce the system to people. And very soon we want to make it so that any fleet can just go and, and, and do it. Um, so, you know, are there I particular think I, regions that are already adopting or I, the, the M 32s are already doing a trial, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. So and, we're, we're kind of working fleet by fleet. Um, okay. and as each fleet kind of gets, you know, an understanding of it and our goal, you know, we, we are, we love coming on site and working with the events and training race officers and, you know, educating sailors on what they're going to see on the water. But ultimately our goal is we don't need to be there. We want. The, the race officer that's already going to be running it, the, the club volunteer that's already going to be out there to be running race sense. So we don't need to be there for every event. Right. Um, so we're kind of, you know, getting each fleet started or each club started. And then once they're, they're up and running, they should be able to run race sense, you know, easily on their own. But, yeah. Right. We, we could train you to run race sense in, in literally 15 minutes. It's really, yeah, really it's pretty simple. easy. Yeah. It's right. not that hard. It's well, your direct Will Hearth is uh, an IOA member as am I. And, IOA would be a great place, I think, to uh, because that covers so many different fleets. Yeah. And if the IOA had uh, a set of, of units that they bought and uh, or rented uh, and training, then that would be a great way to start applying it across a number of different fleets. Uh, yeah. From Opti yeah. to ASCAL or F yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Opti's. We're really excited about what this could do for junior sailing, both right. on the racing side. The coaching side, there's some coaching features coming specific to Race Sense as well that would be really great in a junior sailing context. But also, I just think about it from the perspective of the kids. You know, how cool is it? You know, you see maybe you're watching Sail GP or you're watching the America's Cup and you see, you know, what the system looks like there and the way that the lights, you know, the boats light up if they get a penalty and they clear a penalty. How cool would it be to have that experience on your Opti? I, I would have loved that as a kid when I was sailing Optis. Um, so we're really excited to bring it, you know, to, to junior sailing as well. We, this is not just a system for, you know, high level, you know, high dollar racing. We really right. want it to be truly for everybody. Specific yeah. to the Belgius 15, I know we've got some events coming up on the calendar that the details are getting ironed out, um, but certainly this yeah. spring, there'll be some Belgius 15 events that are using it. We've got some SCAL events coming as well. Yeah. Uh, in the eScal class in particular is really interested. There are already a lot of eScals that use Atlas II, so it's a really easy place for them to start. Uh, but we would love to, you know, try it on some of the other classes as well. And, you know, the other thing is, you can learn things from just your own boat's data, but it's much better when you have the whole fleet because then you have some idea of what was happening in the bigger picture of the race. You know, a lot of what's, you know, you may look at your data and say, oh, you know, our BMG was really poor right here. If you could see the fleet, you might understand, oh, it's because we just got a big header on this side of the right. course, but it's not always obvious just looking at your own data. So bringing together everybody's data is a big part of it. 
Um, and then I think the other thing that's cool, and I think SailGP is actually setting a really great example here, where there's data sharing between the teams with the idea that it helps everybody learn and improve faster. And that's a model that we certainly encourage classes to look at. And so, right. you know, one of the things that you can do with, with RaceSense, every boat in the fleet has now, now a really awesome data collection system on board. Why not share that data with everybody so that, you know, after the race, you can go back and look and see, one, where did you go? But two, you know, what was the guy who, who won that race? What, was, what were they doing? Um, you know, what kind of, you know, performance were they getting? Which side of the course did they go? How much distance did they sell? How many tax did they do? Um, and start to, you know, learn. Because one of the problems I've found oftentimes being, you know, towards the back of the fleet, I can't even see what the, what the people at the front are doing. So it's hard to learn from, from you know, where I'm going wrong because I can't even see what's happening at the front. Yeah, I think, you know, the other thing that's cool about race sense is it hopefully, you know, will help start to build a culture around using data to answer those questions. Because yeah. if everybody in the fleet has the data, then you can, you know, start to have real conversations instead of, you know, as we do today, where we're kind of speculating and guessing back on shore. Right. Oh, I think I wasn't sailing as high as you were, you know, we went left and you went right. And that's the difference. Well, maybe it was, or, or maybe it was something else, right? right? But without the data, it's really hard to know. Uh, is there anything about race sense in particular that that is in your head that you think, oh, I really want to get that? I think it's two things. It's it's the the approach that we've chosen and why uh, we think it's the right approach yeah. um, in terms of accuracy and reliability. Um, and so, two there's two parts. Of that one is the the positioning technology we use with the dual band GPS. And then the other is why we don't use something like LTE, right? Why we don't use cellular networks to do this. We actually went to the effort of developing our own radio network to, to achieve this. Um, and we thought about this an, an awful lot. And, uh, and we felt like that really was necessary to, to do this reliably in a way that people can count on it and, and also make it uh, a, a product that can be offered you know, anywhere in the world. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of components to that, but that's, that's one of the things I, I want people to sort of understand is I think one of the sort of challenges we get is like, why don't you do this with a phone? Well, you, it, it'd be really difficult to do it with a phone for a lot of reasons. Um, and uh, how many times are you on the water and your phone doesn't work? Um, how many times are you not on the water and your phone doesn't work? You can't, we treat this system as, you know, it, it's a, it's a self-healing very fault tolerant mesh network, right? We treat it as, as something critical that, you know, where failure is not an option. Yeah. Um, and so we, we needed that reliability. We needed to really control the solution end to end to be able to do it in a way that we feel like this could be, you know, an easy choice for people that, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's not going to cause headaches, right? Yeah. It's just pretty well, much and you put it in a really, go. A really small package. You weatherized it. You, yeah. you, you did a lot to make, um, you know, this, this device max out for the money you spend, you max out the bet yeah. that you get from having yeah. a specialized device, anything else. If I wouldn't want my cell phone too exposed to salt water. So yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, maybe no. I would not put my phone on the mask. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. sure I want to depend on my phone to have enough battery life. If, if it was pinging satellites all the time. Yeah, so, that's right. That's right. That's they're just exactly benefits right. to, uh, to purpose built products. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But then it's nice when a company like uh, Vaccaro squeezes every ounce of value out of the dollars I invest. That's yes. right. That's right. So the Atlas is, it's a great instrument when you're sailing in a regular regatta that isn't using race sense. It's a great instrument when you're out training or playing with your friends and you're running a race sense virtual regatta. And it's a great instrument when you do race sense. So it's, you know, I think most of our customers today bought the Atlas without really either you know knowing or, or thinking about doing a race sense event with it. And now this is just another thing they get to do with this cool, cool instrument they already own. Right. Fabulous guys. I love it. Thank yeah. You. Love working right. with you.